Good morning. It's good to be with all of you this morning. We are especially glad to have our visitors with us, those who have decided to be here. We truly appreciate your attendance, and we hope that you're encouraged and edified by the things that you've already seen and done here with this local work. But we also hope and pray that you're encouraged by the lesson that we have prepared for each one of us this morning. As many of you, as many of you know, the first Sunday of every month, we are counting down through the top 10. And I want to submit to you right now that it's getting harder to hide these verses from you that are paying attention, the ones that we've gone through and the ones that are left. I've talked to several people in the last few days who they know what number one and number two, and I've tried to hide and to disguise those. It's become very, very difficult, so we're at number two, top ten verses chosen by the Northwest Congregation at the end of the year in 2019. What are the most important verses to you? What do you think are the most popular verses in all the world? And so we selected our top ten, and we came up with a list by those that were selected. Number two is Genesis chapter one in verse one. It is the first verse in the Bible. Genesis chapter one in verse one. What does it say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter one and verse one is probably the most read verse in the Bible. That's where people start if they pick it up and consider God. It would be Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. If it is the most read verse in the Bible, then it is certainly the most read verse, the most read sentence in all of the world. In all of human history, the most read, the most humanized to look at a sentence and read its contents is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. I am convinced of that. We can confidently say that the writings of Moses took place between 1400 and 1300 B.C. The nation of Israel, they had the law, the first five books since that time. Imagine how many millions of eyes, just through the nation of Israel alone, that had looked upon this verse, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. The truth is, our finite minds are blown away as we begin to consider who he is and what he has done. It is encapsulated in one verse. The first chapter in the Bible thrust our minds into infinite depths and then thrust our minds into infinite heights in a whirlwind of boundless amazement. It is truly amazing to know who God is, that he created all things, to, to settle ourselves down and to think about what he has done. Have you ever thought about how busy these six days were as these things are created, brought forth by the word of God? The earth is created and it is formed. It is established. The heavens are created. They are set in order. The stars are ordained and they stand in their place. They do that this very day. He knows each of them by name and they are the work of his fingers. Who has seen the sun or been around him on every side? Who has explored the planets with their belts and their rings? Who has ascended into the innumerable stars and flown through their thoroughfares of glory? In these six days, all things were created in heaven and on earth. Ocean after ocean of constellations are available for our eyes. Many of these stars that we look upon as we stand on the earth would utterly destroy us instantly if they had not been set out at the perfect distance. The deep waters on the earth in which we dwell are filled with life. On, in these six days, the, the, the woods and the forest, they burn with color for the first time. The sky above is introduced to birds of flight for the first time as they effortlessly fly and glide upon the life-sustaining wind that we call air. The earth is alive with all creeping things, beasts and cattle. Think about all of these things coming into being. That God set them in order. He put them where they should be, where they must be because of that order. Plants, animals, the stars, everything is done in an orderly fashion by him with great purpose. Each and every living thing is fully dependent on what he has made in this world. Each and every living thing depends on the other things that are made. All these things work together in beautiful harmony. 
It is this natural truth that assures us that there's no room for the gap theory. There's no need of concern over the six non-literal days argument. We don't even flinch at the findings of the carbon-12, carbon-14 dating. Those things don't trouble us, nor do they bother us, because we know that God made the heavens and the earth and all that is contained therein in six literal days. If you look through the creation and the order of it, and just pay attention to what it says, and I know it's brief. Boy, is it brief. There's no scientific explanation, yet there is common sense allowed for us as we read through it. God creates the grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit trees. He makes all of those on the third day. He does not make the sun and the moon light bearers. He does not put those in the sky until the fourth day. There can be no gap theory. There can be no million years before the, for the creation of trees and then the sun to give those trees life. It is one literal day that these things take place. In the fifth day, God makes birds and everything that is in the sea. It is on the sixth day that he makes insects and all the things that birds feed on. Imagine the birds and, and bees and these different uh, parts of creation living and existing for millions of years without the very thing they need to be alive. They would die out. It's ridiculous. The problem with man is that we found out that science learned some things. And we're trying to make these two harmonize. We want them to work together so it can still all be true. And as Christians, we walk by faith. God has said these things took place in six literal days. And so we accept those things. But there's great peace there. This is the God that will, will bring our bodies back to life for all of eternity and keep us in heaven with him with no sorrow, no need for food. No lust, no lying, no, no cowardice. We will be in heaven in the presence of Almighty God, the one who made these things, and our, our hope rests on that very truth. Think about these six days and the majestic work that took place. By the way, almost all of it before we stepped on the scene. The Lord worked and prepared in order to set us down in what he had made. We see over and over again, he saw that it was good. Why was it good? Because we're coming. We're on our way. It is there for us that we would dwell on this earth and look to him, enjoy these things, and know that he certainly exists. There is design, and there is a designer. The verse starts with, in the beginning. The Hebrew is bereshit. It means, in the beginning, surprisingly. This is the Hebrew name for the book, actually. In the beginning is the Hebrew, the literal Hebrew name for Genesis, in the beginning. And this is crucially important for us as we think about verse 1 of Genesis chapter 1. This is origin. This is God's definition of origin, and it is very important because it talks to us about origin. There are two views of origin in the world today, two dominant views in the world of origin. There is that which we've read together, in the beginning, God. The other view is, in the beginning, Big Bang, uh, accident, millions of years, and some kind of slow developmental process that got us here. The Big Bang, I, I'm not going to go too long, but it drives me crazy. Mass plus energy will never create information. We are built and made through DNA. We understand and know that. We are, we are made. We, we are formed and created. Everything works together within our bodies. Mass plus energy, when everything blew up, will never create information. Information is placed into things. We know this. It is ridiculous to say to people that something blew up and it all kind of, you know, was pond scum and then frogs came out with fish and then the frogs turned into dogs. You know how it goes. It's just, it's ridiculous. None of that makes sense. God says that he made everything after its own kind and that they were to produce to continue to make those things after their own kind. That's God's word and that's what we are eyewitnesses to. Origin, again, brothers and sisters in Christ, origin is vitally important to the way we think. 
if it's a mistake, just think about with me, if it's a mistake, if this is a, an explosion and we're just here, then there is no moral or ethical constraints to our lives. There's no being that's higher than we. We are the top of this earth. We, we do reign over it. There's nothing smarter or greater than we are. If it's God's work, then we are not the highest form of life, and we have to bear witness to that truth. Watch what wisdom says in Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, beginning in verse 22. There are other passages that talk to us about creation and the way that it happened and how it was done. Proverbs 8, 22. The Lord possessed me, this is wisdom. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I have been established from everlasting, from the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no foundations abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, imagine that. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. We read that in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 1. When he drew a circle over the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and my delight was with the sons of men. You see the word of God speaking to us about creation and the things that took place. Wisdom even mentions the dust of the earth. Who cares about dust? We don't like dust. We try to get rid of it out of our house all the time. And yet even the dust created by God and settled down upon the earth the way he wanted. Six days. All of these things were accomplished by the living God. I mentioned something that I believe is very important to all of us and to this world about origin, the creation, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Imagine our young people, just think about a high school student sitting in school, and he or she says to themselves, why am I here? How did I get here? Where am I going? What happens to me after I die? And sitting in that very classroom, he or she is told, we don't know. The truth is, God has placed a value on life. From his word, we know and we understand the origin of the earth, the origin of the heavens that we gaze into, the origins of life, the origin of man, the origin of marriage is given to us in the first two chapters of Genesis the origin of nations, the origin of laws, all of it. Immutable laws are laid out for us in Genesis 1 and verse 1. There's great purpose there. God has made you. You are his. He longs for your heart. Compare that message to, we're not sure. You're, you're here. You're just here. If that's the conclusion, the ultimate conclusion of that, Darwinism says, that we got here by chance, and that means that I'm no better than a mosquito. I'm no important than my dog or the plant that I walk past. You see how damaging that is for us. If we don't know, you're just an accident. It's just by chance that you're here, like everything else. That is so disheartening. It's heartbreaking. But it takes our minds and it takes our society somewhere. Are you watching it? Are you watching what this destructive teaching and doctrine is doing to our children and to those who have come up out of college and have based their faith and their confidence in we don't know why we're here? What, what, is, what does that end up? Where does that end for us? Well, I need to do what I can do while I'm here. Whatever great cause I set forth to do, I'll do it. But when I die, it is over. I want to share something else with you that I don't, I don't think many people know. But racism is embedded in evolution, in the theory of evolution. You're worried about the, the race problem that's going on in this world today. It is deeply embedded into evolution. 
Evolution, again, is the only legalized theory of human origin in public classrooms today. It's the only thing that can legally be taught in our public classrooms. Evolution. If you do a cursory search of Darwin's theory of evolution online and search images, you will consistently see the transition between ape and a man. We've all seen that, that photo. It is from left to right. It's an ape, and he gradually, through the process of time, develops into a man who stands up straight. It is ape, Neanderthal, and then man standing up straight. In every one of the photos and portraits you can find online, man's skin is getting lighter and lighter as he develops and becomes superior from left to right. He is very dark, he's gradually dark, and then he's light-skinned. And the light-skinned man is standing upright. He is superior by the process of evolution. It is deep within the teachings. Evolutionist Thomas Huxley, known as the bulldog for Charles Darwin, has written some disgusting things about race and the destruction of the inferior races that was necessary. I'm not reading what he said. You can look it up if you're interested in it. Thomas Huxley. Followers of Darwinism include Adolf Hitler. Remember, the Aryan race was superior, and the Jews were a subspecies, and so they must be eliminated, and it gives them permission to do that. Darwin teaches that the greatest, the greatest evolved man will be dominant, and so he has a right to destroy the weaker races. Karl Marx revered Charles Darwin. How many lives have been taken from his philosophy and, and Marxism because of his belief? Charles Darwin, in his book, The Descent of Man, in 1871, asserted that civilization of man would advance through the inevitable cost of racial extermination. This is a direct quote from Charles Darwin's The Descent of Man. The more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence, looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. Children are required to read Charles Darwin in our colleges and our schools. He says he believes emphatically that the weaker races must be eliminated in order for us to continue to move forward. That is never, ever in the word of God. What does God say? Let us Make man in our image. He will be like us. Every one of us, genuine, unique, made with purpose. Not one of us are the same. How dare human beings try to separate? And we're so shallow. You know, how are we going to separate each other? Well, color, I don't know. It's ridiculous. And yet, this is the thought process. And these are the things that are taught to our children. You know what I'm thinking? In this time of cancel culture, and canceling out those who preach and teach racism? How come no one's standing up and, and protesting this ridiculous doctrine? Why hasn't Charles Darwin been canceled in this cancel culture? How come it hasn't even come up? We're tearing down statues. And there he sits, a lofty in the minds of the highest of minded people in our society today. How is that? We know. We know. The devil's involved. He rules this world, and he loves it. We've got to tell our children the truth. In the beginning, God created. God. The word is Elohim. It is plural. If you look into that word, it is plural in number. It is God's Judges, rulers, mighty, divine ones. In the beginning, divine ones. We know from Scripture that it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Man, I wonder what that looked like. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. There is the living spirit of God hovering. Deuteronomy uses that word and as it pertains to an eagle fluttering over her nest. There is movement and there is activity. Jeremiah uses the same word and it is rendered there shake. The word of God causes me to shake. There's activity. The spirit of God is hovering, fluttering as an eagle flaps her wings. 
and shaking this concept of the earth now without form and void being being brought into this circular form the heavens being established forever that the holy spirit of god is there and the son he is there the son of god god said is the word of god who is the word of god we know the answer to that don't we john chapter 1 and verse 1 The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit intimately involved in the creation of the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1, in the beginning, that sounds familiar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Who? The Word of God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Verse 10, He was in the world. And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. I mentioned Genesis 1 and verse 26. The scripture there says, come, let us make man in our image. Genesis 11 and verse 7, the Father, the Son, the Spirit are there. God says during the building of the Tower of Babel, come, let us go down and confuse their language. All three are always there. Look at Colossians chapter 1. In verse 15, and we just have to absorb what the Lord is saying to us and who Jesus is. Many don't know him in this way. They know him as the sacrificial lamb, and boy, is that good. Is that appropriate? Colossians chapter 1, in verse 15, Paul will say this about our Savior. Colossians 1, 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or powers, principalities, all things were created through him and for him. All things in heaven and on earth are created through him, for him, and by him. Hebrews chapter 1, in the first two verses, Hebrews chapter 1 says this, God who spoke at various times and in various ways, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. Everything is made through, for, and by Jesus Christ. And again, that helps us with our understanding of the Savior of the world and what he's given so that we could be saved. It's not a message of, we don't know, we're not sure where you came from. It is a message of, God knows exactly who you are. You are unique. You are placed in the timeline that you've been placed on purpose, according to his will. You are his. You belong to him, and he loves you. Let me show you how he loves you. All things are made through him, for him, and by him. All things consist. All things are held together by him. Jesus Christ, the one who holds all things together will suffer and die on a cross. A cross that he holds together. The nails driven into his wrist and into his feet are created and held together by him. Spit flying out of someone's mouth, being hurled toward him through the air which he created, hits him in the face, and he accepts it. Not only that, he holds it all together. They slapped him with their palms and said, prophesy to us, Christ, who is striking you? The only reason their hands are held together is because of who he is. And so he shows us his love in that process. I hold it all together, but you are mine and I want you to know me. Now, the moral, the intellectual standard is set. God created. We are not him. We were not there, but we're here now. He wants us to see these things. The great beauty in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1. No no wonder it was number 2 on our list. Elohim, God's created. The word for created is bara. It means to create out of nothing. I'm just going to let that sit with you for the rest of the week. Nothing? Anybody want to define nothing? 
open, vast space where there's nothing inside, no stars, no earth, no, no. There's no space. There is nothing. No thing. And he created through his spoken word. Let there be. And it was. This is the God we serve. As this world turns and we live our lives and dedicate ourselves to him, knowing that every breath comes from his almighty hand because he loves us, that we're submissive to him, we serve him, we honor him, his word is first in everything. You have not been brainwashed by some dumb old book. You have been told in a very deep and intimate and thoughtful way that you are loved, you are cared for every minute of your life. And though men cause up, stir up and cause trouble about race, and issues about why we should be fighting, no, not through the Christian's eyes. We are all vitally important to God. He loves each and every one of us, and he wants everyone to be saved. What a great, great message in the very beginning. First verse in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you've come to know that that is true and you want to obey God, we also always offer the invitation to you. God expects those who hear his word and understand his truth to, to come to terms with their own sin and to say, I understand that without Jesus Christ, the creator of all things, who died willingly so that I could be saved, he expects me to do something so that I can embrace him as my Lord and Savior, so that I can enter into that relationship and be counted as part of his church. Please do it. Please come to Jesus right now in this hour and know that you are saved by the God who made you. It can be accomplished right now. We're begging you to come forward while we stand and sing to encourage you.